Hey guys, welcome to the original, inaugural, very first episode of How I Built This, Birmingham style entrepreneurship. It's uh, sort of a, the, inspired by the famous How I Built This podcast that a lot of entrepreneurs listen to, including me. Uh, a lot of nerds out there like myself love the content like this. And as a fellow entrepreneur in the Birmingham market, I wanted to inspire other people to start their own business and build it and do some of the same things that I've had the honor of doing. Uh, my name is Ron Holt. I'm the CEO and founder of a residential cleaning company called Two Maids in a Mop. We have 85 locations across the country. And most recently, we have introduced a second brand that we are piloting right here in Birmingham called Pink Zebra Movie. You may see the stuff behind me. And it brings me back to all those early, early days when we started growing Two Maids in a Mop. Uh, many, many moons ago, now almost 18 years ago. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself along the way, but more importantly, I'm going to introduce you to other entrepreneurs in the Birmingham area and give you a chance to learn from their story as you build hopefully your own business. And today we have a Birmingham staple with us. When you think Birmingham businesses, to me, uh, as an outsider coming in, I moved in here about uh, 12, 13 years ago, uh, my wife, who is from Birmingham, said the first thing you have to do as a Birmingham outsider is eat some barbecue at Dreamland Barbecue. And that's what we did. And she was right. And we've been there a, a lot uh, of times over the years. So today we have Betsy McAtee. She is the president and the daughter of the original founders of Dreamland Barbecue. And I, I can't wait to hear this story, Betsy. I know it's going to be super entertaining and fun and, and I'm sure educational as well. So Welcome to the very first episode of How I Built This here in Birmingham. Thank you, Ron. I'm so excited to be here with you today. And this is this is exciting. It's an exciting day for you. And congratulations on everything you've done to get to this point. Oh, well, thank you so much. So I want to go back to those early days because I know at Two Maids in a Mop and now here at Pink Zebra, those early days are right with all sorts of headaches and struggles. Nobody sees those when things are going really well. They just assume everything goes, you know, you know, straight up to the moon. So we're going to get to some of those struggles here in just a second. That, that's always the fun part for me. But before we do that, can we talk about the Dreamland story? Um, it goes back now, I think, 50 plus years, you know. So talk to us about those early, early origins and, and how you got to a place where you are today. Okay, perfect, perfect. Well, we were actually founded in 1958 in Tuscaloosa, Alabama by uh, Mr. John Bishop. Uh, he also was called Big Daddy because he was uh, rather large in, in size. And he was um, a brick mason by trade and wanted to provide a better living for his family. So he felt like he had a calling and a dream and it was to build a neighborhood cafe on the hillside beside his home, which he did. And like a lot of neighborhood cafes back in the, the 50s, he sold everything from hamburgers, hot dogs, canned soda to postage stamps to candy. But what he saw through the years was he would sell out of his ribs and he like a true entrepreneur. He said, I'm just going to sell ribs. So he sell he for, for many, many years, he sold ribs, white bread, barbecue sauce, canned soda and bags of chips. And, and, and that was it. And, um, through a friendship with my father, Bobby Underwood and Mr. Bishop, um, that's how I got here today and how we're talking today. Well, that sounds very similar to my most recent mill at Dreamland. <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, we've had people come in from across the country to learn more about our franchise opportunity. You know, you name it, from Southern California to New York City to South Florida. And they come to Birmingham. And number one, they almost always know about Dreamland. But number two, they come in and they go, they get the white bread and they're like, what do we do with this? You know, the Northerners, and the, you know, the folks from outside the Southeast are, they don't know that's an appetizer. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. You got to have that. The It has to be white bread, right? Ha, you know, full on white bread with, the, right. you know, no whole wheat in there at all. <laughs> 
and a heart barbecue sauce and you just dip it in there and you know as they say ain't nothing like them nowhere <laughs> that's right they are fantastic so all right so let's talk about the business um i, I know that you came in i believe in the 90s um it took over leadership right and, and your and your parents were, were a, a little bit before before you so Tell me, do you know any fun stories from those early days when they were really trying to ramp this up to something bigger than just a, a small business? Sure, sure. So I moved to Birmingham in um, 1992, and my father opened the store on Southside here in Birmingham in 1993. And at the time, I was working for Frito-Lay. I had moved up here uh, with my job with Frito-Lay selling potato chips. So I, I like to tell people I've had three jobs in my life, pantyhose, selling pantyhose, selling potato chips and selling pork. So that, <laughs> that's where we are now. And um, we opened in May of 93. And when we first opened, we didn't know, you know, really what to expect. I know there was an appetite uh, for dreamland outside of Tuscaloosa. And when we first opened, we used to have to close in the middle of the day between two and five to catch back up um, because ribs take anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour to cook. So it's not, you can't just put a slab of ribs on and be ready to go in five minutes. So we would have to completely shut down during those times and, and kind of get back built, built back up to be able to re be ready for the dinner. Well, so, and you can't collect revenue, right? When you're, when you're close no. to two to five. <laughs> no, you can't collect, but it gave us a chance to catch up. But on the very first day we opened, it was, we didn't really know what to expect. I mean, we ran out of toilet paper. We're running, you know, to the grocery store, to Sam's, buying toilet paper. I mean, it was, you know, looking back on it, it was a comedy. It really was. It was, a, you know, but we, we made it through and the, the people of Birmingham have been so supportive and been supporting us ever since. Right. So how many locations do you guys have today? Today, there are 10 locations, um, seven in Alabama, two in Metro Atlanta and one in the, the Panhandle of Florida. So how, how different is it managing those stores outside of the market versus the ones in your backyard? So every Dreamland location is a little bit unique um, because we don't really have a cookie cutter approach to our building sizes. And so, and then also in Tuscaloosa, the original restaurant, because it's still in the original building, right? A, wow. A bishop you know, infrastructure wise, we, you know, we don't have a large kitchen. So we're very limited in what we serve there. And we still predominantly sell ribs there. We have a few side items, um, but, but that's, that's really it. And then in our newer stores, we have everything from salads to chopped pork, chopped chicken, um, all the, all the side items, banana pudding, chocolate dream. So we have a, a, a much larger menu selection and we can do it because when we opened those stores, we, we knew we were going to be serving more than, than just ribs. Right. So do you, how the management of each individual store, I know some are franchised and some are, are owned corporately. Um, how do you motivate management to do the work? You know, you're, you're not as involved, I'm sure as you probably at one point were, and certainly your parents were, um, so how do you motivate those folks to do the work for you, even though they don't have ownership potentially in the business? Well, I think it's just being part of, of something bigger. And, you know, we are, we are so blessed with a fan base and a guest base that, that truly loves our product and loves telling the story, right? There's so many times where I'm in a restaurant and I'll get to talking to someone and they're like, well, let me tell you about my very first Dreamline story, you know, and it's, it, it's priceless. So our core purpose is to preserve family food memories by, by maintaining that tradition. And the tradition is the way we cook our, our food today. 
you know, we still cook our ribs over an open pit, hickory fired open pit. There's a lot of barbecue concepts out there now that don't do that. You know, they've gotten right. away from that. And that's very, very important for us to do it the way that Mr. Bishop did it, the way Mr. Bishop taught us how to do it and continue, continue upholding that legacy of the way he cooked his ribs. So I want to talk a little bit about the life of a business owner now. You know, almost everyone who starts a business, you know, they think about Shark Tank on TV, right? You know, you stand in front of these folks who have a bunch of money, you pitch for five minutes, your business model, you get a bunch of money, and then you go buy a yacht and sell yeah. off to the Caribbean. You know, that's, that's what people think, you know, and I and you both know that there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that go along um, the way. And so, right. you know, early on, as you build a business from the ground up, you literally are doing the work in a lot of cases. And then as you grow, you know, hopefully you're getting closer and closer to that yacht, you know. <laughs> so what is life like for you today compared to what it was when you first came into the organization? How, how different is your day-to-day -day, um, activity? Well, my day-to-day -day activity now is, is probably um, at a high when I say a higher level, I, I am involved in things that I'm having to think six, eight, 10, 12, 24 months down the road. Whereas before when I started in the restaurant, you know, I was wor worried about, okay, do we have enough ribs to make it through this shift? Right. Or what do I need to be ordering for this catering event that's coming up, you know, tomorrow or two days from now. So what I do the bulk of my day now is spent on, you know, making sure that we continue to wow the guest with that, that experience, right? But how do we continue to grow and be better versions of what we need to be day in, day out? Got it. Got it. So no, no Caribbean yachts yet. <laughs> no, in fact, um, what I, what I may be looking for is to be on a fishing boat in uh, Logan Martin Lake. This there week. you go. <laughs> that sounds pretty good to me. Because <laughs> so, I think 45 minutes. <laughs> that's right. So one of the things that I hear from our franchisees in the two maids in the mop world and what I hear from other entrepreneurs is, is hiring people and how hard it is, you know, how hard it is to just number one, hire good people, but then even more importantly, how it is, hard it is to keep them hired, to keep them motivated and inspired to do the work. Uh, do you have any secrets that you've learned along the way that can help uh, an aspiring entrepreneur find that great employee? I, I think the biggest thing, and we are blessed. We have, we have some employees in some of our locations that have been with us since day one. So 20 years, 25 years. Wow. And, and that in our line of work in the restaurant industry, that is very, very rare. Um, so I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, you, you've heard the term people over profits and we, we do try and, um, you know, treat our people well, our team members well. It, it is exciting to be a part of something that's been around a long time. And our guests are, our guests are who, who keep us around, right? If they decide no longer to, to, to come to us, then we, we, don't, we don't exist. So it's maintaining that that guest experience. And, and everybody plays a part in that, Ron, from you know, our pit cook, who is the, the MVP, if you would, of the restaurant, because they're the one actually cooking the food that you're going to be eating, right? right? And they're celebrities, if you would. I mean, we have guests that come in and they want a picture with the pit master or, you know, they're very enamored with, you know, what are you doing? How do you do that? Um, and then from our servers who have that direct interaction with the guests. So it's just all a, a part of that. And we have four, um, four of our core values. And one of them is it's always game day. And we're best on game day. And if we treat every day like game day, the guest is going to have the best experience. Our team members are going to have a great experience. And just it's a win-win for everyone. 
I love it. That's awesome. You know, it, it, what, what's so inspiring to me is hearing how it all connects, you know, your customers and your employees aren't two different people. They're not two different segments. You literally connect to those two and they depend on one another. It sounds like for the business to go. Right. Right. Absolutely. We can't have one without the other. Right. Okay. So I'm going to get to some kind of fast rapid fire impromptu questions if you're ready for those. Okay. Okay. Hopefully hopefully I won't put you on the spot too much here. So uh, (laughs) my favorite one uh, that I love to ask every entrepreneur that has been through the rigor of those early startup days to where they hopefully are today when things are, are, are better. If you could go back, in your case, that would mean a long time ago, you know, 1958 is a long time ago. And even in your case, in the mid 90s coming in, if you go back to those early, early days and you could revisit those and do one thing differently, what's one thing you would do differently today? This is an easy question for me. And it's, I would have gone and cooked ribs side by side with Mr. Bishop. That would have been fun, right? Yep. <laughs> that it, almost, it, you know, at the time, I, I, I had two um, two young kids, and I, you know, it never it never crossed my mind to do that, you know. But I I wish now that I had done that because he passed away in in 1996, and I never got an opportunity to do that. Wow, he's a legend for sure, no doubt Absolutely. about it. Yeah. Um, so from a from an operational standpoint, as if you were to start, let's say, uh, another company today that, will, you know, your, your world's food service. So we'll keep it to food service. So let's say you were to start a, a food service concept tomorrow. Uh, what's, what's one thing you would do differently from, from a high level, you know, not like, you know, maybe do the dishes or whatever, but from a really high level, if you, cause we're talking to somebody that's out there that wants to either start a business or has just started one, or maybe has started one and is experiencing some failure or lack of success. And they're trying to figure out, did I do the right thing? Should I start this business? Um, What's something you can tell them to say, hey, starting a business is the best thing ever? (laughs) So I think for me, um, you know, we all have areas where we're strong and we're weak, right? Um, and for me, it was always on the accounting side of things. I was, took a couple of accounting classes that I had to in college. I couldn't stand it. Yeah. I mean, it was just not my thing. Right. Sure. And I think the most important thing in, in any business you start up is you've got to know every facet, right? Because as you grow, you lose kind of touch with all of that. And if you ever, you know, heaven forbid we ever have a pandemic again or, or something that just sure. you know, rocks your world, you've got to be able to go in and fill in the gaps. And I think as you, when you're starting out, a lot of times you may outsource a few things because you don't have the personnel, but I feel like you need the need to spend the time to have enough working knowledge of it in your business that if something happened, you could continue to fly the plane, so to speak. I love that. I love that advice. So many people get so caught up in the glory of the business. And obviously that's why you start the business. You should be excited about the glory, but I mean, I mentioned it earlier. You do have to do the dishes sometimes. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So you, you had a, a good segue here. So last year was 2020. It's the year of the pandemic, the year of COVID. And life for all businesses turned out to be a lot different than what they expected. And certainly in food service, I'm sure it was a complete 180 compared to what you expected for the year. What did you do? I mean, how did you survive the, that period of, of life we all lived through? Well, I think the biggest thing is there's there's no manual, there's no book, there's no one that has that has gone through something like this that that's alive today that could I could you know say what did you do? Um, I think for for me what what I had to do was look at what because it happened quick, it happened fast. There was not a whole lot of time to react. You know, we you, we saw things on the news, but you know, I was like a lot of people, oh that that's not. No way. That's, right. that's, that's far away. Um, but I had to um, 
you know, preserve cash. That was the main thing is preserve cash and think what can I continue to operate and how can I continue to operate so that if I make it on the other side of this, we, we're, we're still standing. So what we did was if it wasn't absolutely necessary for guest safety or guest comfort and keep in mind by this point restaurant dining rooms had shut down Mm -hmm. uh we we did away with it and it was things from direct tv you know we we had no tv in our restaurants um you know because we didn't have guests coming right no reason to all the it was all the little things that added up to be bigger things in the end and we reacted we acted immediately it, it was not like we waited a week or two i mean when we had to start shutting down dining rooms we we knew what that meant so we we started you know cutting out all the the extra at that point it was tough it was tough it's still tough you know uh, but it's it's hopefully we're, we're coming out on the, on the other end of it now yes yes it's a lot better now than it was six months ago right for sure all right so let's talk about birmingham you know there's hopefully everybody's watching this again as one of those aspiring local entrepreneurs that wants to to build their own dreamland barbecue um you know what have you learned about the city of birmingham and what it can do for an aspiring entrepreneur or not even aspiring someone that's already in business like how how good has birmingham been to you guys and how good could it be for other to other people Birmingham has been wonderful to us. I mean, we were, you know, we opened up, you know, in um, 1993. So we've been here a while. But the change in Birmingham in terms of the entrepreneurial spirit and the acceptance for, you know, thinking outside the box, creative thinking, finding that unmet need and, and meeting it has been, it, it it's it's been transformative from what I've seen. Um, and I just think, you know, the, the folks of Birmingham, the people of Birmingham, the residents, the, the city leaders have really acknowledged that, you know, there is a lot of benefit in different smaller entrepreneurial type businesses. And, you know, we've had some very successful ones that started here in Birmingham and that have really grown to huge proportions. It's been phenomenal for us, honestly. I mean, that's that's the reason we have our pilot store right here for Pink Zebra in Birmingham. You know, the original Two Maids and a Mop was not based in Birmingham. We relocated here um, years later as we started growing a little bit farther north of our original location. And we were a little worried about it because in franchising, most franchise organizations are headquartered in exotic places, San Diego, Tampa, Charleston, you know, somewhere you'd want to maybe vacation on top of do a little bit of work. Um, in our case, Birmingham is, is very, it's just a work community, you know, a family style uh, marketplace. And so we were worried about finding talent. We were worried about, uh, you know, what type of um, external, you know, exposure do we get from that? What are people, there's very few franchise brands basically in Birmingham. It's turned out to be phenomenal for us. I mean, in, in terms of talent, that's never been an issue. You know, there's a lot of smart, hungry people here. Uh, probably more, more than we can ever find, you know? And so it's, with all the things we've done, Two Mates to Mob and now King Zebra, being located and headquartered right here in Birmingham, that was the best thing we could have ever done. We never knew that when we, when we first opened how great it was going to be to us. So I, I think it's a wonderful city to start a business. And like you said, the entrepreneurial drive in the recent years, even during the pandemic uh, period, it, it's, it's, it's stronger than ever since I've been here. Absolutely. And I, you know, Birmingham is a, a, a little well-kept secret. We're a little uh, jewel hidden hidden amongst the, the mountains here. Um, I think that when you, a lot of people, you know, they, they know Atlanta, they know Nashville, but Birmingham, sometimes we're not on the, the radar of folks, places, and we, we it's a great, great place. Right, I agree. All right, so let's. I'm gonna hopefully give give you some more questions. You can give some advice to these entrepreneurs that are out there in Birmingham. Uh, I'm a nerd. It's like totally cool calling myself one of those things. I eat up all sorts of content when it comes to business, investing, economics, marketing, whatever. Um, what puts 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 most people to sleep. It like really feeds me. 
And so whether it's a podcast or a good book or even a good friend that just wants to talk about business, um, I eat it all up. So do you have a resource, uh, whether it's a book or a podcast that that's been important to you and your development as a leader that may be helpful for other entrepreneurs here in Birmingham? Well, there's so many books, Ron, and so many podcasts. Um, I'm going to stick on the book end. There's, there's a couple. Uh, one is a classic, Peter Drucker's The Effective Executive. But most recently, the, the book that I've referenced the most, especially during the, the pandemic and the challenges we faced, is Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. And it's based on the Rockefeller Habits. And that has been one that I have, have gone to several times over this past year and just, you know, what what do we do and how do we do it? And let's 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 not lose focus and sight of what we need to do every day. It, that's a great book, especially for an entrepreneur who's really trying to, to grow, to scale, you know. So whether you're a small business that just wants to own your zip code or a small business that eventually wants to own an entire industry, that book can take you there. You know, it's, it's almost like a roadmap for us. I agree with you. Absolutely. All right. All right. So what about advice? Like if you were, in, you were in front of someone right now, you're in front of a wall of, you know, an auditorium full of wannabe entrepreneurs and they're all looking to Betsy and Betsy's got all the answers. What's the one piece of advice you'd want them to, to leave the room with, to never forget? Never stop learning. Never stop learning. And, and, one of my favorite quotes is um, something to the effect of hustle and smarts. And it's, um, let's see, hustle beats smarts when smarts doesn't hustle. And you just got to get up every day and, and, and keep moving and keep, keep learning and keep going. I love it. I love it. You, you and I share a lot of, a lot of uh, philosophy and, and when it comes to business, I mean, I, I tell people this all the time. My, my favorite four-letter word is grit. Uh, you just, that's not something you can teach or train. Either you got it or you don't, you know. And so I, that's, that's, I think, what you just said to everyone out there. Hopefully you're listening because, you know, the, the, the Caribbean cruises are, are down the road, hopefully, for you. But to get there, you got you to gotta hustle. You know, you, you got to work. You got to do the dishes. So, Betsy, thank you so much for your time today. It was so fun hearing the Dreamland story. Like I said, when we first started, when you, th when you think Birmingham and business, the first thing that comes to my mind and most people that live here is Dreamland. You've been great to the community. I know we've worked together and you've helped uh, with a lot of charitable things you know, and when communities have been in need. Um, I know this is bigger than just profits for you. You know, it's a bigger purpose. And so it, it's an honor for me to have the opportunity to talk with you today and hopefully everyone that's been watching this learned something so they can help inside their own business as well. Thank you. Thank you, you Ron. It's my pleasure. All right. Well, thanks again for your time. We'll see each other around the block. Absolutely. Okay, Birmingham, you just heard it. You heard a story of how someone right here in our hometown of Birmingham, Alabama, build a business from the ground up into massive success. It was an inspiring story, so inspiring that I hope somebody out there uses it to build a business right now, today. If you know of anyone out there that has enjoyed a similar amount of success, please, please contact them. Tell them to listen to this interview because we want to talk to them. The entire purpose of this podcast is to inspire entre entrepreneurs from the Birmingham area to do the same thing of what you heard today from this entrepreneur. I love entrepreneurship and I love the city of Birmingham and I hope somebody out there is as inspired as I am. So thanks for listening today. I want to give a big shout out to Jeremy Allen. Jeremy's the guy behind the scenes doing all the technical work. He has been a godsend and his creative energy is very inspiring as well. So Jeremy, thank you. And for everyone else, we'll see you again next time on How I Built This, Birmingham Style.